Hi, everybody, and welcome to Culture Talks episode six. I can't believe we're at episode six already. Today, we are delighted to be joined with the one and only Martin Gilchrist. And we've got to know Martin uh, a fair bit in probably just over a year. And I could give him some amazing intros, but I don't think anyone does it as good as him. So, Martin, do you want to give us a wee bit of background about yourself? <laughs> And uh, you can you can explain to the audience who you are, what you do, and why you're here. My goodness gracious me! What an introduction! How, how do I even how do I even follow up with an introduction like that? There, I'm just going to have to go with a good old um, bread and butter plain introduction. My name is Martin Gilchrist, and I'm here from Gilchrist and Co. Chartered Accountants. That's 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 where I work with my lovely wife Michelle, who is the principal Michelle Gilchrist FCA. And what we do there is we look after professional people in independent practice. That means professional people who work for and by themselves, and that might be QCs, barristers, doctors, architects, web producers, people you might see on TV. But it could also include people in the music industry or pastors, religious pastors. And so what the point is, we work with a broad range of people who work for themselves and by themselves. And I'm gonna say one more thing with four points, because I always do this, it's sort of my job. I have to, so I apologize for that. The four things we do are self-assessment tax returns, corporation tax returns, VAT returns, and payroll. We don't do anything else because we do those four things incredibly well we are we, you're not going to get anybody better at kpmg or pwc because that is our cool face focus that we look after for our clients so does that give you a sufficient introduction to who i am jp absolutely martin thank you very much for that intro um just to give the audience a wee bit of background what we're hoping to discuss today and we discussed this before we come on is obviously there's going to be a spin of high the topic impacts the culture of organizations and the, the people that work together. But we wanted to go into a bit of focus around how uh, the informal leadership of the organization. So those who aren't in a supervisor or manager role and uh, what, how they influence the people around them. Um, but also uh, what, what makes up the attributes that you need in order to influence the people around you. So maybe we could give a nod towards what things to look out for in your team, what types of behaviors, maybe even values that people can hold in the roles that are quote unquote below you in the structure and how you can utilize them to the best of your ability. Um, but Sean, do you want to kick us off and maybe we could lead us in a direction? Because we, we have no script on this, just so everyone knows we're just going to have a conversation because we get on so well with Martin, we don't need any of that. <laughs> No, Robert, I mean, I think, think it's safe to say we had a short conversation beforehand, and I was very interested just to hear how much experience you had in, in different roles. And like one, of, one of the main topics we're obviously discussing today is informal leadership, and we, we discussed this in our, our last culture talks, sorry, two culture talks ago, but formal in, and informal leadership. And I'm interested to hear about that in different sectors. I mean, in our background, we're very used to hospitality and leisure and what it takes in those environments. And just interested to hear a bit more about your experience of informal leadership and um, what you think, what qualities you feel that people need um, to be a good leader. And of course, it okay. doesn't have to be a manager. It could be anyone to become a leader. And I actually think you have such good qualities of leadership in everything that, that you do and your persuasiveness and how you, <laughs> you encourage people to come along in your journey with you. I think, I genuinely do think that you are very good at that. So I'm, I'm interested to hear some of your Insist, Martin. I think you're right. The first point you made there, Sean, I think is a very good one. It depends on the audience or the team that you're trying to lead. If you're leading soldiers into battle, it's going to be somewhat different from leading um, a team of caterers in a restaurant. Or maybe it's not, but you know, it's, it's going to be different. And in my environment, my environment, I am trying to influence, encourage, and more importantly, bring together and motivate people who are maybe more senior than I am, maybe more influential, more knowledgeable, more have better resources. Because at the end of the day, I don't really lead anybody at Gilchrist & Co. Gilchrist & Co. is a small practice. There's, there's only three of us in the practice. 
and Michelle is a principal, so I'm not telling her what to do. <laughs> on a we get you in trouble. <laughs> and, and James gets on with his stuff, he doesn't follow the agreement. So when I'm thinking about leadership, I'm thinking about, okay, what is it that I'm trying to do with the community that I want to engage with? Yeah. And fundamentally, what I believe is that small businesses and sole entrepreneurs and professionals in independent practice, those sole director companies that aren't getting any help under any of the grant schemes at the moment, you know, I, I can't understand that. But those types of businesses, the, the sole trader, the uh, sole director companies, or the, the businesses that have small, small teams, I think they are the ground rock of business um, entrepreneurship, um, of communities, mm -hmm. um, of the, the economy generally in this country and throughout the world. Now, I appreciate I'm going off point stop a wee bit, uh, of course, here a little bit, but there's a reason for that. Um, the reason I think that they are vitally important is dead, dead simple. All you have to do is ask yourself one question. Imagine an economy, a country, or a world where all you had was the public sector and large corporations. Imagine a world without small businesses. It's unimaginable. But people forget about that. So these people are crucial, okay? People like you guys, like me, and like the people we see every day and work with every day in our business environment. And what I want to do fundamentally is I want to strengthen my connections with those people and use my knowledge and experience of 23 years of working with businesses to make their lives better, easier, more productive, to motivate them, to inspire them, to encourage them, to bring them together in a way that makes them more effective and better entrepreneurs. Not necessarily to make them bigger businesses. I don't care about big business. Big business can look after itself. My primary fo um, function, my primary um, focus is those micro enterprises and building a community around them. So when I'm thinking about leadership, I'm thinking about how do I use whatever influence, and I don't know, I suppose I do know, but whatever influence I have to take them on that journey with me. That's fundamentally what I'm doing. Excellent, excellent, yeah. Um, no, I, th I think that's a, a very good just point. Just, sorry, sorry, let me, let me hear. Does that even touch on the question you asked? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot no, what the question um, was. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it does. The first thought is no, but no, I, I, I can genuinely see No, we do need leadership and certain, I mean, even for us, from, from, from our point of view, you know, we need support, we need help, and we need lead in certain particular areas as well. And I can definitely see well, your role is really strong within business organizations because you can give them so much advice and, and so much encouragement as well to, to bring them in a certain direction. And I think that's what leadership is. It's about we, we know what we want to achieve. So that vision, be it large scale or small scale, whatever it may be, it, it's knowing where you want to go and mm. basically get there. Mm. And the leader is the person who's going to drive people there. And I think no matter what it is, what context you put that into, you're fundamentally doing going through that process of leading people to a vision. To me, that's leadership. Yeah, that's what I said. That's what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's important to understand that it, it, like, I think mentorship, for instance, um, so you can sort of say that's an informal style of leadership from an entrepreneurial perspective. So you, you along your journey of entrepreneurship, and we definitely have, you look upon other people. We, we just mentioned some people. Um, before we came on. Henry McCrory, for instance, being one of them that stands out. Um, Henry is somebody who is just very similar to yourself, Martin, very selfless, always happy to pass out information. I see Henry putting um, teams of calls together just exactly like you were. It's to bring people together to provide support in a common goal. So like Sean said, there, we're all trying to travel in one direction. That's what leadership is. It's influencing people in a positive way to reach a common goal and when you have when you look at mentorship and Sean and myself have uh, looked at that in the past we, we actually went to Gavin Wall very early on into our journey and he, he mentored us for a good six to sort of seven months and that had a massive impact on us and in that scenario 
he became a formal leader for us because we we engaged in a in a contract with him and and friendship and made sure that we were uh, creating. He was allowing us to create accountability for ourselves. But then you have people like yourself and like Henry who fall into an informal leadership role for us because you you we look to you who a few people who have been in this in the, your roles and on your entrepreneurial journey for much longer than we have. You're doing a really good job of it. And you make it look easy, might I add, right? So you're you're looking at people like that, and I think of within teams, whatever industry you're in, you find that in the teams that you're in. So you may be somebody like from where we're used to come from, from the hospitality and leisure background, and you're working in a large group of people. There are going to be people within that team that you look to naturally, and as leaders, as managers, from Sean and myself's perspective, in those in in managing and leading those teams we can admit that and i think many people watching can admit when you're in a formal leadership role in order to be truly effective you understand their strength in numbers and the way that you can guide that's those strength in numbers is by bringing people on board we like to call them cultural ambassadors so we we try to identify those people through some of the, the skills that they'll have and usually it's communication skills that usually comes to the top of the board emotional intelligence being part of that as well understanding the people who have empathy they are able to control themselves especially in instances where sometimes customers can be a nightmare um, but they hold themselves well is maybe another way of describing it and for me it's, it's very important to be able to identify that martin do you do you what, what would you say would be some of the skills that somebody from an informal leadership um, perspective would need in order to influence the people around them um, I think you've touched on one of the most important attributes or skill sets of all in terms of informal leadership, and that is identifying other leaders. Yeah. You can't lead by yourself. You know, if nobody's following you, if, if everybody's off in another direction and you're you're walking along with the flag, you're doing nothing at all. You're just wasting yeah. your time on everybody else's. So you need to be able to bring other people with you. And it's really good to have a set of good followers or the first follower if you if you can go into an organization or a situation where there's a crowd of people an audience that you need to encourage to come with you within that there will be credible people that already hold those positions of leadership that you've just described and they may not and they very usually aren't formal leadership and um, roles where they in within a hierarchy have authority because of what the hierarchy says they have the authority because of their credibility, their confidence, their um, strength of will, their um, ability to speak out, their coherence, their um, empathy, their um, the click or the, the 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 relationships that they have already. And if you come into that situation and try to lead that without first of all getting their buy-in, your job is going to be very much more difficult. And I suppose the first time I learned that was. Um, when I first left employment and went into self-employment, I didn't immediately start with Gilchrist & Co. Um, I started a consultancy practice where effectively I was going into legal firms that um, needed assistance with their um, administrative accounting and case management procedures. So I was maybe going in and changing a lot of stuff, bringing in new software, bringing in new policies and processes. And in that, you step on a lot of toes, not on purpose, but just the nature of the beast is you yeah. change anything, there's a lot of people that don't like to change, particularly if they have established um, power bases or um, ways of doing things or control mechanisms and stuff. And it didn't take me very long to realize that within a solicitor's practice, the, the, the majority of the day-to-day -day leadership doesn't come from the partners or the solicitors, they're way off doing their own thing somewhere else. They expect the practice to run smoothly behind them and, and to provide them with the resources they want. They don't want to get into the day-to-day nitty-gritty of how pieces of paper are moved about or how computers are turned on or off. And I real, realized very quickly that within those organizations, you may have um, solicitors practices in Belfast with 100 staff and layers of management, just as you would expect. But within that, you will have key legal secretaries or key administrators or even the influence of i've seen the instances where the a, a, um, a doorman you know the person that sits at the desk at the front 
yeah. gives you the badge as you come in and out and answers the phone and points you direct in the right room and stuff. They'd been there that long and they knew everybody and they knew the ins and outs and who was married to who and who was doing what. And you know, when they went out to Christmas dinner and they'd, they'd have all the great stories and that I, I say I've seen them practice where that person was one of the most influential people in the yeah. whole building out of a building right where because they just knew what they, they didn't have an ambition to become the the uh, managing director of, of the organization, but they knew um, that they had a certain influence over how things went, and you didn't, you didn't, um, you didn't mess with, them. you know, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't change something within the fundamental way of um, what, what you didn't change any in their, within their circle of influence without getting their buy-in first. Yeah. So yeah, leadership. I think that's that's one of the key things that you need to do is identify Absolutely. the leaders. But then there's traits that you have to have um, for leadership. One of them is confidence. Um, people are attracted to confidence. Um, you don't have to be a leader. You know, to get to be a leader isn't difficult at all. Just stand up and start leading. Take a decision and start moving in that direction. Yeah. And people will follow you. 100%. The difficulty that comes with leadership is as soon as you start going in that direction, soon, as soon as you take responsibility for leadership, People will disagree, <laughs> you know. Even if they're following, <laughs> yeah. you, they go, they'll, they'll start. They'll walk around behind you. Going, We're going the wrong way. It's it's like if you put out your mates, and it's, you're going to a stag night, for example. A stag night is a, 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 a very obvious example of this. And in a stag night, you normally don't just all stay in one pub. You normally go to two or three different pubs at least, if, yeah. if, if there's not a crawl. And you're you're there with people that you don't know. So there'll be friends that you do know, and there'll be people that you don't know. That's just the nature of stags, and. I would say in virtually every single stag night that I've been on, by the time you've got to the fourth pub and you're deciding where you're going to the fifth, because then you're starting to look at, are we going to a disco, are we going to be a club, or are we going to, you're going to get, start getting disagreeable. Well, we we'll can't go there. And, and, well, you decide. You decide where we're going. Okay, we're going to Dempsey. Uh, no, we're not going to Dempsey. <laughs> That's, that's <laughs> yeah, that just shows you how long it is. <laughs> there's many bars yeah. been since then. <laughs> yeah, it's, honestly, it is, I don't think there's only even a bar there anymore. But the point is, the, the essence of the point is, as soon as you take a leadership role, there will be people that <laughs> disagree with you. It's just the nature of humanity. And yeah. so you need to have the confidence. And then people talk about emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence. What does that even mean? We well, sort of know what it means, but there must be there must be a definition for it. JP, what's the definition of emotional intelligence? The definition uh, of emotional you're intelligence. Geez, you're putting me on the spot there. I can tell you the elements of it. I don't know about the actual definition. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we sort of know the gist of it. The gist of it is yeah. that when you're having a conversation like this, can you read what's going on in the other people's minds? Are they bought in? Are they yeah. interested? Yeah. Are you the person that they actually want to listen to? Or are they just looking over your shoulder to see who the important person is mm -hmm. and what it is that they're going to say? Are you upsetting them? Are you angering them? Are you enthusing them? Are you, you know, there, there's an awful lot. Now, maybe I've got emotional intelligence. It's all wrong. But that's what I understand by emotional intelligence. And finally, because I don't want this to be a monologue, Martin, because Chris just make it stop off. That's why you're here, Martin. Head. That's why you're here. <laughs> um, but uh, the thing is, communication. Mm -hmm. Communication. If you're not able to communicate your idea, because essentially leadership, well, leadership is a massive subject. I've, I've got textbooks on leadership that uh, I've never opened. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they're big, burdensome books, you know, yeah. full of. I might have gone like this. Close it again. <laughs> but there's an awful lot in leadership. Um, yeah. But um, essentially, leadership is this idea of um, you have to bring people along on that journey. And yes, you can do it by coercion. You know, I'm paying you, you better do it. Or um, by threat or by sometimes embarrassment. Oh, Johnny's done 50 of those and you've only done 25. What's, what's holding me up? Or whatever the case may be. But those form of leaderships don't work in my environment. And I can only talk about yeah. my own experience. 
for me to be able to provide any leadership at all, because I'm not, not the coolest kid in town. You know, they're going to follow me for, you know, because I'm cool. Um, I, I don't have money to give to anybody. I, I don't have a physical authority. I'm not a big guy, you know. So what is it? What is it that brings people along? And what I find is by bringing together emotional intelligence and communication, I create something of value that's not just of value to me, but as a value of them as well, which is part of my route map. And I explain the value to the people that I want to bring on the journey. So if I'm having, if I'm organizing, and um, one of the things we did recently was um, a night out in town where we brought together about 15 different business owners. And I asked the business owners to present on, on various topics. And it was really about helping people, business people to connect, reach out with, with each other. But I got the value of being the center of all of that. But why would 15 people turn up in the middle of time, find their way there, prepare a presentation, help me with that process? Because there's people, um, JP, you're included, and really were part of the team that helped me pull that together. Why would anybody do that? Well, I must have been able to sell them a vision of what it was for. And if you can't communicate that, you're not going to be able to lead. And communication isn't just verbal. You know, it's not just the words I say. 100%. Because to be completely honest, nobody's going to remember. Like if I went to you, JP, and I said, JP, what did I say five minutes ago? Having the clue that you're talking about yeah. in a minute, Martin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that it down? <laughs> but, okay, there you go. Sean, Sean wrote it down. There you go. But most people will have forgotten what yeah. it is that you've said. But what they'll do is they'll get a gist. And they'll get a gist not just from your words, but it's from your actions. Are you acting in a positive, confident way? Are you inspiring? Are you using rhetoric in your language? Rhetoric being nice that sense of using pauses and um, mod modulating your voice up and down and yeah. using accents and laughter and movement. Are you using those things? Because all of that's part of the issue. Um, are you using different platforms to get the story across? So communication isn't just face-to-face. -face. You use this Zoom for communication. You use text. You know, are you issuing updates, reminders, notices? Is your communication consistent? You know, are you the person that people think you are when they see you again? If, if I'm really nice to you guys because you are asking me to come on to your brilliant webinar, now, but the next time you see me, I'm a, I'm a nasty we get, <laughs> or, or, or even worse, just completely ignore you. Uh, yeah. Those guys, uh, I, I think leadership and bringing people in your journey encompasses all those things. And although you do develop over time, there's an I could be completely wrong here, but there's people I know who have been in leadership roles for many, many years and aren't great leaders. Mm -hmm. They have the role, they have the position. Yeah. But they don't bring people along and there's i know other very young people who maybe don't have a lot of experience but are really great leaders um, yep. i think of matthew thompson for example might be oh, an example of yeah. a great leader yeah yep. so he's, a, he's an influencer an influencer makes him a leader and if he wanted to take people in a certain direction i'm pretty sure that, that he would be able to do that so I think you make some really, really good points there, and and Sean, you can jump in anything you want, but I noted in our exam uh, in the experience because I I mentioned ours because we worked in the same management team for around thirteen years, but um I think it's important to identify, and you made a good point at the end there, Martin, about uh you can be in a leadership role formally but not be a good leader, um and it's the differentiation between management and leadership, um and I find that have it adapting the approach of continual improvement in self and in process so understanding that in order for you to become better at what you do you need to put it's that leaders developing leaders approach so if you take a step up pull somebody up with you and unfortunately there's many people not for bad not, not, not that they're bad people but they're they're hard afraid of giving away an inch in case someone takes a mail and they steal their job and I've seen examples in the past, unfortunately, of people who, are, who have the potential to be fantastic formal leaders, I suppose squashing out the potential of an informal leader. And, under, and I think it's important to appreciate that in order for you to grow, the people below you need to grow on the hierarchical structure. And 
Sean, do you want to give a little bit more background around that or even add to that? Because it, I, I'll end up stealing the monologue as well. <laughs> as well. As well. <laughs> Martin, Martin, me and you could take this call for ours. <laughs> I could do it by myself. Just trying to find no. a gap. Can you shut up for a second? <laughs> No, no, what you're saying there, Dave, and what you found, you saw Martin, was like the old management style, the old leadership style that is in place in a lot of places. And, and it is that sort of, I suppose, dictatorship almost. It's almost, as you, as you mentioned, Martin, you're, you're paid to do the job, just do it. You know, it shouldn't be anything else. But we, we, of course, know that it needs much more than that to encourage people to move along. And we talk about different generations as well. And I don't like using generations X, Y, Z. I, I don't really believe in all that. I think people are people. And that's just that I think people can be persuaded. To do what they need to do if you treat them properly and the whole emotional intelligence piece comes into that martin as well where treating people like understanding of people first of all understanding their perspective so that they can understand yours and and that's where the communication piece comes in and um, and once you once you get people on board and you show empathy for different things that they have going on in their life for example and, and just getting a general understanding of people and see once you get that sort of engagement and that respect built up between two parties I think there's no loss after that you know no matter what happens you can always have an open and honest relationship and it's, it's not about dictating things and telling people what to do i mean we always say you're never telling anyone what to do you're asking them would they do this and, and if you have a problem with that that's either because the person is way off scale or you're doing something wrong and no matter what we we ever done i always kind of look to us as the problem before i look at anybody else as a problem so if someone acted irrationally do a simple request that we had after them I would first of all say, but first of all, did we have? Oh, we lost you for a second, Sean. Have we? Yeah, it must be no, I... for too long. It must be Argo again. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Sean's uh, internet has been playing up today, so that's probably why uh, he's he's dropped what? off there. But why he's gone? He's probably probably panicking in the in the background there. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> he's back. <laughs> Was you were away there for a week. We, we lost yeah. you for about yeah. 30 seconds. <laughs> well, I can't repeat all that again. Was it you? good? Did you, were you cool. saying something? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, just to pick up from what Sean, we didn't hear what Sean said there, but I'm sure what you were talking about, Sean, was corporate governance. Aye. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, in relation to leadership, and we're talking about informal leadership, but I, one of the things, one of the very valuable lessons I learned from um, informal leadership, such as my roles in um, when I was, when the board of Down Enterprise Park decided that they wanted me to be the chairman. Um, even in informal, like I said, that was a semi-informal role in that there was no real authority. There was, like, I wasn't responsible for the wages. And I wasn't a line manager, essentially, yeah. within the, the park. But there was a responsibility there. And when you've got a group of people with different agendas who are coming together under a common idea and you're trying to lead them, they need to know that there's a structure that provides fairness. And very often, the best way to structure fairness into an informal or formal group is to make sure that there's well-defined governance rules. Yeah. So how does someone get elected? How does someone get to vote it or, or bucked out? What do you do if there's a disagreement between parties? Um, who has responsibility for what roles? And at what point can it be usurped or where, where, at what point can their decision be changed up over their heads and all that type of stuff? And it doesn't take you to get very long into any sort of a group or an organization that those questions start to come up. So even people with the very best sort of intentions, people who want to start an entirely charitable foundation where they're supporting baby lambs or raising, uh, I don't know, I don't want to be too flippant about it, but you know what I mean, a football club or whatever the case may be, you're going to get differences of opinion. And it doesn't matter if you've got the best emotional intelligence and communication skills and the best way of telling a story that people can buy into that you're going to lead them if you don't have the governance rules supporting that and if you don't follow those um almost like um, there, there's a term for it generally where, where, where the laws of the land have to be followed um i've forgotten it's, it's, it's gone out of my head but basically yes you can have informal leadership but if you're going to do it with any, any form of structure whatsoever you have to have good governance yeah, yeah. 
we had sort of like that as, as the values. Whenever you were talking about the, the stag do example, Martin, which I thought was an excellent example in terms of leadership and, and the divide that kind of can happen. Yeah. I think when you have good values within an organization, and this is obviously one of the things that we would focus on in terms of the culture, um, once you have that, to me, the values answer all the questions that you have. So if you can tick all the boxes with the, the values, then you're going in the right direction. And I think that sort of encourages people to stay um, on the same path and, and work towards the, the common goal. You would always kind of say that the values are kind of like the, the Bible of, of the work that you're, you're doing because they gauge you through um, what the right path is. Mm-hmm. And there's, a couple, there's a couple of things I wrote down just from the, from the last things you were saying, Martin, as well. But like, when you talk about leadership as well and the guy, the guy at the front counter, we, we encountered um, an organization at one point where there was a, a lady who worked there for over 20 years. And commun- communication was a main breakdown there. And this, this lady was seen as sort of a negative influence on the organization. And once we get in there and had a conversation with them and done a bit of a focus group and really found out the bones of what was, was going on, really, really simple problems. And she knew the organization inside out, had the most influence on people, and that was an easy turnaround at that point. And it was just really simple problems because of a breakdown in communication. And one of the things that springs to mind, as I think I mentioned before in another one of our culture talks, was something that Kevin Young had said to us um, before. And it really struck the chord with me, and I've mentioned it a few times, is he was talking about a young boy in a class and basically some of the work that he was doing. And, and this boy was seen as was causing a troublemaker, basically. And one of the things that he was looking at him was going, you know, this boy definitely has leadership skills, but it's what he's going to do with him. He's either going to lead a drug gang <laughs> or he's going to do really positive things. And it's what direction does he go? Because once you have them leadership qualities, you can go either direction. I suppose like the guy at the counter you're talking about, you're saying, you know, if you get on the wrong side of him, <laughs> it could be a bad thing. If you get on the right side of them, it's a really, really good thing. So I think it brings in the argument of leadership in terms of are leaders born or made or a little bit of both. I mean, I, I do think there's natural qualities that it requires. But I also think that one of the problems that, that occurs with the, the old management style and, and the, the sort of leadership style is that they aren't properly trained. A lot of people are catapulted into positions because organizations have a little bit of a panic. A manager leaves and they have someone who's been there for a very long time. And you automatically think, well, they're the best person to do that, but they don't have them, them leadership skills. And that's where a lot of the problems come from in, in terms of the, the managers who are causing um, problems. And that's where informal leaders become really, really important because otherwise the rest of the, the rest of the people within that organization will suffer greatly unless they have someone else to kind of step up and take a lead there. I yeah. see we're running short in time here as well. We've got six minutes left. So uh, yeah. uh, there's one final point I would want to make on this um, right. before you guys go through the process, wrapping up and ask me whatever other questions um, you might want to have. In reality, most people don't want to lead. You know, there's there's only, in, in your community or in your society, there's only so many people want to, are willing to take the brickbats that come with leadership and, and take the rewards and take, take the rewards to go with that as well. But if you look, I often say to, to my son when I'm talking about how stuff gets done, you know, it's one person in 10, maybe. If you look at a group of 30 people, there's going to be three people in that group that do almost all the work. You know, the rest of them may be lifting stuff and carrying it about and setting it down or filling the forms or doing whatever it needs to be. But there's two or three people that are doing the thinking, doing the planning, coming up with a strategy, um, voicing the strategy and pushing it forward. And those two or three people, if you put them in a different group, they'd be the same people doing the same thing. So these people can be identified. Now, they may go into a different group and there may be a bigger, badder leader who maybe takes control of that particular situation, but that will be another group where only two or three people are taking the leadership role. So you have to be aware of that. Not everybody in every situation wants leadership. Yeah. Never mind, can do it. So yeah. you have to make sure that if you are trying to encourage leadership, because as, as we started right at the very start of the conversation, informal leadership is bringing people along with you, but it's also encouraging the right people that have their own leadership skills to play their part in that journey by doing their bit of leadership. But when you're identifying those people, you have to be very careful that you're not putting pressure or usurping or, or taken into your confidence people that maybe just aren't cut out for leadership in that yeah. particular role. And it, that boils down to all that emotional intelligence, communication and skills as well. Yeah, you can you can be more right. I think it's 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 also important, I think, because I know we, we've got one question we try to ask everybody, and I'm sure Sean will ask it um, in a second. But, you know, it's important. 
I suppose if there's a takeaway, just like you mentioned there, Martin, about so not everybody wants to be a leader. Um, there may be people who have leadership qualities, but they just shy away from them. Um, and, and that's fine because everyone has a choice. But I think from a, a, le a formal leadership perspective, for any manager, owner, supervisor, anyone in a formal leadership role um, who's watching, I, you may ask, well, why is it important to identify in formal leadership? Well, like we mentioned through the conversation, if you want to implement any kind of change in the organization, and let's face it, we're always moving, you know, the, ma the macro environment, so especially right now with everything going on, is going to impact your business. Sometimes, unfortunately, in many circumstances, the businesses are closing as a result of this. It's your informal leaders who will help you drive change in a positive way. It's even if they know that you're doing it or not, you can you can rely on people's qualities and give them a, a, a positive nudge in the right direction, knowing whether they do or not, that other people will follow them because they have that influence. And it's it's about building relationships and that's where the emotional intelligence side comes into it. Martin, we could go on for hours, I think, with you because you're you're so well suited to the types of conversations we love to have because we'll go off in tangents or whatever. <laughs> so, and Sean, do you want to ask him the question we ask everybody? Yeah, just, just, just to finish up, Martin, like, I mean, I think we all need to be leaders in, in some shape or form because we need to be able to lead ourselves. Um, and one of the things we, we need to do that is we need a vision. So we need to know where we want to go. And, and that is our final question is, what is your vision? How are you going to lead yourself to your vision? <laughs> you know what? I, I, if I was one of the, somebody said to me once, uh, Martin, you never say I, you always say we. And it didn't hit me until that was actually pointed out to me. But in conversations, I do always say we. Now, when I say we, I'm not talking about the greater we, the, the, the community in Northern Ireland or the business community or anything else. Yeah. I'm always talking about Michelle and my son Marty. So what we are going to do, what we plan to do. The we is me and Michelle and our son. Yeah. And I always talk about we. And when we were starting our business many, many years ago, we did have a vision. And the vision wasn't a big stack of cash or a helicopter or a Mercedes or the type of stuff that you generally think about. When you, when you think about when you picture your, your business being successful, what does that look like? The we for us was a cottage industry for the modern age. Cottage industry for the modern age. And when I think of a cottage, I think of a, a wee man standing behind a loom and the ducks <laughs> running around the door outside and a big fire in the hearth and the wife over in the corner doing her bit of the job. And you know, that genuine sense of family, um, skill, um, nice living location, um, freedom to work the hours that you want to work. Um, freedom to choose who your suppliers and your customers and the, the, your, who your network are going to be. And that was all encapsulated in a picture. So we, 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 had, we created a picture, I can call it my hands, right? um, we, created, we created a picture of what that was in our mind. And I literally have a picture of a cottage in the county down countryside with trees and roses above the door and a big hearth and a stone floor and a kitchen table, but with all the latest technology. When I'm working hard, when I'm suffering through January and all the tough times and taking a break bats and stuff, that's the vision. A cottage industry for me and Michelle and my son where we get to work as a family. Well, absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. And a, a great note to finish on. Thank you very much for your time today, Martin. Um, been Thank you. Insightful, as always. Great conversation, as you always are. Um, we very much appreciate your time. So, so thanks very much for, for coming on. And for everybody else, remember, as we always end, engage, enable, and empower. Thank you.